Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 as we continue into part four of our series on spiritual gifts. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting in verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes these words Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Amen. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy, Paul has written. Now, Paul began this entire section on spiritual gifts back in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, with the statement that he did not want them to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. In other words, he did not want them to be uninformed regarding gifts, their nature, their source, their use. He did not want them to be ignorant, and he doesn't want us to be ignorant either. So what are some of the key things that we have learned about spiritual gifts over the last few chapters? I've enumerated a list of about 10 different things that we should have taken away from our study of these last few chapters. Number one is that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, make no mistake, they can mouth the words, they can repeat a phrase, they can parrot an expression, but they cannot say it and mean it unless the Holy Spirit is at work in their lives. It is the responsibility of the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin and of judgment and of righteousness. And it is that gift that God has given us of his Holy Spirit that leads us to the place where we can encounter Jesus Christ and move into a saving relationship with him. We are saved by grace and that through faith and that not of ourselves, but it is the gift of God. Amen. And so God has given us that gift, and that gift comes to us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The second thing that we've learned in our study of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit is that there are diversities of gifts, but it's the same Spirit who gives those gifts. We've also learned that there are differences of ministries, but it is the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities but that it is the same God who works all in all. So for one, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts. There are different functions that those gifts may have. And each of us may have a gift that is different than the gift that our, our friend has, right? Or that our spouse has or that the person sitting next to us has. And sometimes you might even have the same gift, but that gift may operate in a different way. And the operation of that gift may have different results. Yes? So we all have different gifts, and those gifts operate in different ways. Those gifts have different effects, but ultimately, it is the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God who gives those gifts to us. So there's a diversity of gifts, but there is unity in the source of those gifts. The third thing that we should have taken away is that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So God has given you various gifts and he has given you those gifts not so that you can hoard their use for yourself or so that you can take pleasure and or pride in the possession of or exercise of those gifts. He has given you those gifts for the good of the body. He has given you those gifts to use. For instance, if you know how to cook really good spaghetti, I mean, you just make the best spaghetti. And sometimes you'll go into the kitchen and you'll make, you know, those really big pots, the ones that you can't figure out how to fit underneath the cabinet because the second shelf gets in the way and the pot's just too big. You know what I'm talking about? You make a big pot of spaghetti like that and you're going to grab that fork and just what? Start eating from the pot yourself and just not share any with anybody? That's ridiculous, isn't it? 
Now, when you make that big pot of spaghetti, you're going to share that spaghetti with the rest of the people in your household. And if there's leftover, you might package some up and take it across the street to the neighbor. You might decide to go ahead and bring it to church and share it with somebody. You, you, you're going to share your gift because God has given you that gift. Or maybe when there's a potluck, you're like, hey, I'll make the spaghetti. I make really good spaghetti, right? You don't have that gift, whatever your gift may be. And I'm not saying that the making of spaghetti is a spiritual gift, but it could be, right? It could be. So it, gift of helps, for instance, or a gift of hospitality could be manifested in that you love to cook and to share the blessings of what God has, has given you with others, right? So the manifestation of that spirit is given to each one, but it is given for the profit of all. The fourth thing that we learn is that the Spirit distributes to each one as He wills. As He wills. There's nothing wrong with desiring spiritual gifts, and there's nothing wrong even with desiring specific spiritual gifts. We have the right to ask, don't we? We are, in fact, encouraged to ask, but ultimately, God decides, and He gives to each those gifts according to His will, right? It, it's like at Christmas time as a kid, you're like, well, I want this toy, I want this toy, I want this toy, but ultimately who gets to decide which toy you get? The person who's giving the gift, right? The person who's giving the gift gets to decide which toy you have or which gift you have. You can ask, but ultimately the decision is in the hands of the giver. So the spirit distributes to each one as he will. Fifthly, we learned that we are many members in one body, the head of which is Jesus Christ. And God has set each of us in the body as he pleased. So as members of the body of Christ, we all have a different function. We all have a different role. We all fit into a different place. But God is the one who has organized and established the body. Sixthly, and this ties very closely to the previous two, we are not independent of one another. And the exercising of our gifts is not to be independent of one another, but rather we are interdependent upon one another. In other words, I need you and you need me. We all need each other because we need the gifts that God has given to each and every one. That means that everyone has value. Amen? But no one has more value than anyone else because we all have gifts according to the grace of God. And again, we are not independent. We are interdependent. And as such, we are to care for one another. Sixthly, no, seventhly, excuse me, seventhly, if one member of the body suffers, we all suffer. And if one of us is honored, we all rejoice. Amen. That's why we took time this morning before the message to pray for various people within the body who are experiencing at this very moment traumatic circumstances. They're going through hard times, and when they hurt, we hurt. Amen? But likewise, when someone has a success or a victory or overcomes a problem, we rejoice with them. So we suffer with one another, and we rejoice with one another. Amen? We weep with those who weep. We mourn with those who mourn. We rejoice with those who rejoice because we are connected to one another. Number eight, no one person, we've learned, has all of the gifts and there is no single gift that everyone possesses. The scripture is very clear about that. Not everyone has the gift of prophecy. Not everyone has the gift of healing. Not everyone has the gift of tongues. And sadly, there are some denominations, some uh, charismatic denominations out there, some, I should say, hyper-charismatic congregations out there where they have been taught that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not really saved. And that is unscriptural. It is unbiblical. And they'll say, well, brother, don't you understand that speaking in tongues is, is the sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It's like if you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you're going to speak in tongues. They will say that. And while I do believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that speaking in tongues is a sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is not the only sign of baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so, yes, you can have the Holy Spirit and you can have the gifts of the Spirit and yet never have spoken in tongues. Why? Because Paul asks, do all speak in tongues? 
And the obvious answer to that rhetorical question is no. Not everyone speaks in tongues. Not everyone has gifts of healings. Not everyone has gifts of prophecy. Not everyone is a pastor, teacher, or evangelist. We each have unique gifts that God has given to us individually. No one person has all the gifts, and there's no single gift that everyone possesses. Number nine, we learned in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, is superior to the gifts of the Spirit and is the more relevant evidence of Christian maturity. Amen? To have a gift is wonderful. To know how to use that gift in love is even better. Amen? That's why Paul said that he would show them a more excellent way, and that more excellent way was love. And then lastly, we learned that when Christ returns, when Christ returns, when that which is perfect has come, and as I shared with you last week, my belief is that which is perfect is referring to Jesus Christ. There are many today who will teach that that which is perfect is referring to the completed canon of the scripture. And they believe that once we have the full canon of the scripture, that many of the spiritual gifts passed away and were no longer necessary because that which is perfect, the word of God has come. And I believe that that is a misapplication of that verse. And if you look at most commentaries, the vast majority of commentaries prior to the opening of the 20th century, they will take that more classical view that that which is perfect is referencing the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. And when Jesus Christ returns, the gifts of the spirit will be unnecessary because then we will know as we are known and we will see him as we are seen by him. That which is perfect will have come and will no longer need prophecy and will no longer need tongues and will no longer need gifts of healing. Why? Because Jesus will be with us and we will be with him. Amen? So again, the 10th point here is that when Christ returns, the gifts will no longer be needed, but love will endure. Why? Because love never fails. Amen? And that means it never stops. It never runs out. Love never fails. Why? Because God is love. Amen? So those are some of the key points that I hope you took away from our study through 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 13. And if you'd like more detail on any one of those points, those messages are available on our website and on our YouTube channel. So we've talked about all of those things, and now we come to verse 1 of chapter 14, in which Paul again says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Now the question comes naturally, why, Paul? Why should we especially desire the gift of prophecy as opposed to the gift of tongues? And he's going to give us a very thorough explanation of the distinction over the next 18 verses or so. I love that he begins the statement, though, with the idea that we are to pursue love. Amen? And that we are to desire spiritual gifts. What that tells me is that love is worth pursuing. Spiritual gifts are worth asking for. Are we to pursue spiritual gifts? No. We're to desire them. We're to ask for them. But we recognize that God gives them according to his will, purpose, and plan. And that once we've received them, we're to be responsible with them in their application within the body. But love, we are to strive for love. We are to pursue love. Our focus should be on exercising and developing love within the body. Amen? Love is our aim. It is our goal. We are to pursue love. And to desire spiritual gifts is a good thing. But especially, he says, that you may prophesy, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, and no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, the first thing we need to recognize there is that when someone is speaking in tongues, when they are exercising the gift of tongues, they are not speaking to the congregation. They are not speaking to other believers they are quite literally addressing the Lord. Now, you may have been, how many of y'all, show of hands here, 
How many of you all have come from a Pentecostal and or apostolic and or charismatic background? Just show of hands. Okay. So a lot of you have seen the exercise of the gifts in one way or another. Maybe you saw it done in a positive way. Maybe you saw it done in an irresponsible way. I don't know and I can't know, but there are some of you who did not raise your hands. And you may be thinking at this moment, what in the world is he talking about? What have I stumbled into today? When are they going to start doing laps around the sanctuary and swinging from the chandeliers? Well, the good news is if you were to run laps, we've made sure that the aisles are indeed wide enough. Just watch out for the pole in the center aisle. And there are no chandeliers, and I promise there are no snakes in the building that I am aware of. But it is an old building. So I say all of that to say, have there been abuses of the gifts in the church? And the answer is yes. In fact, there were abuses of the gifts in the church in Corinth. So abuses of the gifts is nothing new. That's been going on from the very beginning. And it is in part the reason that Paul has had to write these things down because he doesn't want them to be using their gifts in an ignorant way, right? He wants them to be wise and to be informed regarding their use of the gifts of the Spirit and to have an appropriate attitude towards those gifts. And we need that as well. So if you've ever been in a, a charismatic service or a Pentecostal service of some kind, and you've heard someone speaking in tongues, you may have, or at least you should have, after that, heard someone else interpreting what it was that person has said. And we're going to learn more about the interpretation of tongues as we continue through our chapter today. But if someone in a church service did speak in tongues, it would be appropriate and indeed necessary for there to be an interpretation of what they said. Now, oftentimes what you may have heard is a misapplication of this gift in that someone may have said something in tongues and then someone else may have quote unquote interpreted it and said something like, thus saith the Lord, you need to this and that and the other thing. And they're addressing the congregation. If that is what you heard happening, then according to the scripture, that was not an appropriate interpretation of the gift of tongues because tongues are addressed to the Lord, not to the body. They are speaking in an unknown tongue the glories of God and worshiping and offering up prayer to him. So what very likely may have happened in that instance is you heard someone speaking in tongues and then maybe someone else sharing a gift of prophecy or sadly, sometimes someone faking it and just pretending that they knew what they were doing. It's sad, but it's true. Sometimes the gifts are exercised in a way that people are drawing attention to themselves rather than directing attention to the Lord. And that's one of the things that we have to be on guard against within the body. So Paul, again, in verse 3 of chapter 14 says, But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. I want you to notice that. He who speaks in a tongue speaks to the Lord. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Verse 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Now, these words, edification, exhortation, and comfort, are important words. And these words tell us something about the nature of prophecy, okay? Sometimes people think prophecy and they get kind of weird about it as though, well, this is what's going to happen to you in the future, and it becomes almost like this exercise in fortune-telling, right? That is not an appropriate use of prophecy either. Now, prophecy can foretell future events, absolutely, but typically those are events relating to and centering around the kingdom of God 
or the exercise of the ministry of God's kingdom. For instance, when Paul was headed down to Jerusalem to keep his vows and to bring the gift of support to the church in Jerusalem that had been gathered by the churches in the Gentile world, there were prophets who were coming to him and they would have his belt and they would tie his belt around them and they say, whose belt is this? Because the Holy Spirit is testifying that chains and persecution await him in Jerusalem. And Paul's response was, okay, that's great. I'm, I'm ready to be beaten and imprisoned for the sake of the gospel. I'm ready to die for the sake of the gospel. I appreciate the forewarning, but I'm going anyway. And they were trying to persuade Paul not to go to Jerusalem so that he could avoid the things that were being prophesied that would happen there. So those were specific gifts of prophecy that were exercised in order to warn Paul of what was coming. Okay. But typically what we see exercised in the church is that prophecy is not just foretelling, but forthtelling of the word of God. And we see here that the result of prophecy is edification, exhortation, and comfort. So when you go to someone in the body and you're like, you know what, I just feel like the Lord wanted me to share this with you. And here's this verse. I was reading this verse and, you know, this is, this is it, you know, and, and this, is, this is what the Lord put on my heart to share with you. And, and that verse just fits just perfectly. And it encourages that person and it builds that person up. And it, it encourages them to move forward perhaps in an area of ministry in their lives or to, to turn away from a particular area of sin, whatever the case might be. It turns them from their problems to the Lord. Guess what just happened? You exercise the gift of prophecy. Isn't that awesome? You're like, but wait a minute. I didn't say thus says the Lord and I didn't, you know, I didn't tell them what was going to happen in the future. No, you encourage them in their walk by pointing them to Jesus. That is one of the primary functions of the gift of prophecy. The word edification means to build up. It is the act of building up the act of one who promotes another's growth in Christian wisdom, piety, happiness, and holiness. Amen? What a beautiful definition of exhortation. I'm sorry, of edification. What a beautiful example of edification and one of the functions of the gift of prophecy. The next one was exhortation. And it means a calling near, a summons, a supplication, an entreaty, an exhortation, an admonition, or an encouragement. It is a persuasive discourse, a stirring address, that which affords comfort and refreshment. So in other words, when we go and we share the word of God with someone and we encourage someone in their faith and our words move them to action in their walk with God, guess what? That was exhortation and that is one of the functions of the gift of prophecy. And then comfort, of course, is any address, whether made for the purpose of persuading or arousing and stimulating or of calming and consoling. So when we comfort one another with the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God, we are exercising the gift of prophecy. That puts prophecy in a totally different point of view, doesn't it? It, it puts it in a different light. It's not some weird thing it's simply speaking the word of God into the life of another person in a way that is going to build them up, encourage them, or comfort them. And that is superior to speaking in tongues, according to the Apostle Paul. And that is a gift that is to be more greatly desired than the gift of tongues. Because again, he says, desire prophecy, because he who prophesies he who, who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Now, again, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So when you speak in tongues, and Paul would go on to say, I wish all of you spoke in tongues. If he wished all of them spoke in tongues, does that mean that they all spoke in tongues? No, it does. It means, in fact, the opposite, that they didn't. In fact, Paul would say that I, I speak in tongues more than all of you, but... Speaking in tongues only builds up the individual. And it is good as an individual to be built up and strengthened in your faith, isn't it? That's good. But if our motivation is love, then we should see the superiority of building up everyone else instead. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about just from a mathematical perspective. And I'm not a math person, but I think I've got this one right. If I focus on building myself up and you focus on building yourself up, how many people are focused on each person being built up? One, right? 
If I focus on me and you focus on you and you focus just on yourself, then the number of people focused on any individual within the congregation is one person. But if instead of focusing on myself, I focus on building all of you up, and each of you instead focuses on building everybody else up, then how many people are focused on building me up? How many of you are there here today? 50, 60, 70, 100, however many there are. That's how many people are focused on you as well. Why? Because we're all focused on the good of everyone rather than on our own edification. And so he goes on to say that he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Verse six, but now brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying or by teaching. In other words, if I come speaking in tongues and that's all I do, have you benefited at all? And the obvious answer is no. You only benefit if I do these other things as well. Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? He uses the example of an instrument. If I go up here and I grab my guitar, and I just strum the guitar, but I make no effort to strum the guitar with rhythm, and I don't bother making any chord shapes, or if I play in a way that is completely disorganized, it's not going to be pleasurable, it's not going to be entertaining, it's not going to be edifying, you're not even going to know what song I'm playing. Oftentimes in the past, prior to the advent of radio, military commands in a battle were issued through the sounding of a bugle or a trumpet, right? And I could probably give you one right now. If I were to say, da 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 what is that? Charge. Wow. Like generations after it was no longer in use as a military signal, you still understand what it is. And if we do that other one, what's that one? Wake up, get up, because the, the melody has a meaning. The tune has a purpose, and it is communicated through the organization of the notes and through the communication that is affected when it is presented in an appropriate way. But if there's no method or madness, if it doesn't play a tune that is discernible, then you won't know when to charge. You won't know when to wake up. You won't know when to go to sleep. Why? Because there is no effective communication unless we recognize what is being played. Verse 8, for if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? You know, this has applications for pastors as well. If I get up here and I've done all of this research and study into the Greek, into the Hebrew, into the Aramaic, and, and I have climbed up into my ivory tower and developed just the most beautiful theology, and I come out here and I speak to you in terms that you don't understand, in language that I don't explain, if I just come out speaking Greek and say, well, this is wonderful because it's the original language that the scripture was written in, but you can't understand what I'm saying, are you going to benefit from the preaching of that sermon? No, you're not. One of my favorite quotes from an old pastor by the name of J. Vernon McGee is this. How many of y'all know J. Vernon McGee? I see there are some Bible bus riders in the building. Praise the Lord. J. Vernon McGee used to say, you got to put the cookies on the bottom shelf where the kitties can get to them. Do you understand what I'm saying? He was saying you need to make the word of God approachable, comprehensible. You need to present it in such a way that it could be understood even by the most innocent of hearers. Amen? So we want to speak in a way that can be understood. Verse 9 continued, for you will be speaking into the air unless people understand what is spoken. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so, you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, 
let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Amen? It is appropriate for you to desire spiritual gifts. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, the church in Corinth was very zealous for spiritual gifts. They were eager and excited for spiritual gifts. And Paul's exhortation to them is, that's fine, that's great, but make sure that your motives are pure. Make sure that your motives are founded in love. Make sure that your desire for spiritual gifts is so that you can build up the body of Christ and use those gifts as you serve the Lord by serving his body. Amen? Therefore, verse 13, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Paul is referencing something that I think we've seen before in Romans chapter 8. Go ahead and turn there with me, if you will. Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 26 through 28. And while I hate to jump into the middle of another point that Paul was making, this is illustrative for what we're talking about today. In verse 26, Paul says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. I think we can agree with that without even knowing what he was talking about before, can't we? Does the Spirit help us in our weakness? Absolutely. For we do not know what we should pray as we ought. Have you ever had that feeling that it's like you know you're facing a difficult situation and you don't even know how to pray. You don't even know what to pray. It's like you're praying and it feels like your words are just bouncing off the ceiling. How many of y'all felt that way before? You're like, is anyone up there? Are you listening? Do you hear me? Sometimes prayer feels like that, doesn't it? And we don't even know what to pray. And, and so... Paul is saying the Spirit can help us in situations like that when we don't know how we ought to pray. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God of God. Amen. So I believe that what Paul is referring to here is praying in the spirit. And when I don't know how to pray, if the Lord has blessed you with that gift of tongues, when you don't know how to pray, then you can simply exercise that gift and pray in a way that you don't even necessarily understand. You don't know what you're saying. The spirit that dwells within you knows what he's saying because he is interceding for you with groanings that cannot be uttered. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I believe that that's what Paul is referring to here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And in verse 13, he says, Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God, Paul says, that I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. I'm going to repeat that. I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, where's the key phrase there? In the church, right? So the exercise of the gift of tongues, if that is a gift that God has blessed you with, is appropriately exercised independently, privately, as a form of prayer that is a language that exists for you to commune with the Lord and to be built up and strengthened and edified in your faith. 
But in the church, it is more appropriate to speak in a way that can be understood by all so that all can profit from the things that are said. Now, does that mean that it is never appropriate for someone to speak in tongues in church? Well, no, that's not true. There are times that it is appropriate. And Paul has made the exercise of that gift very clear in that there must be an interpretation. Now, just as there is a gift of tongues, there is also a gift of interpretation of tongues. It's a spiritual gift, just like the other one. And Pastor Chuck, in his, uh, in his book, Charisma versus Charismania, on page 118, I meant to bring it with me, but I left it sitting on the dining room table as I walked out the door today. So I will have to just tell you the story rather than reading it to you. And it actually bridges this week's message and next week's message quite well. So I'm going to tell it to you today, and I'm going to read the, uh, the quote to you next week to start off next week's message. But there was an instance in uh, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, when the church was still fairly small. They were having a service one day, and Pastor Chuck knew that there was a woman there who happened to have the, the gift of speaking in tongues. And he had heard her speak in tongues before. Now, sometimes the exercise of the gift of tongues will be in a language that is a real language but is unknown to the individual. Other times it could be the, the, the language of angels. We don't necessarily know, but we know that that's true because of what we read in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, where Paul wrote, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. So he gives this description of tongues as being the tongues of men or the tongues of angels. So it could be either and we don't necessarily know which it is. But in this instance, Pastor Chuck had heard this woman before and usually when she spoke in tongues, she was speaking French. And he recognized it because he had studied some French in school. And he also knew that there was another woman within the congregation who had the gift of interpretation. And so in a worship service one day, he asked the woman if she would speak in tongues so that there could be an interpretation and so that the body could be edified and built up. And so the woman began to speak and she was sharing about the, the glorious things of the Lord. She was praising God, which is an appropriate use of the gift. And after she had finished speaking, another woman got up and gave the interpretation so that everyone present could be in agreement with what was said and could be edified and encouraged and built up by it. After the service a woman was brought forward who was visiting uh, some friends there at the church and she came up for counseling. And she said, before I talk to you about the reason that I came and the questions that I have, I just wanted to ask what was going on here today? I I've never seen anything like that before. I mean, this lady over here got up and started speaking just this beautiful French, you know, that it was like a, a, a very, very eloquently. Uh, she said, I, I lived in France for six years and I was really impressed by just her diction and the way that she was speaking. And then this other woman got up and, 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 and interpreted what she had said. Why did you guys do that? And Pastor Chuck shared with her, he says, would it surprise you to know that neither of those women speak French? He says, this woman over here who spoke, I know her and have known her for a long time and I can assure you she doesn't speak French. And I know for a fact that the other woman doesn't speak French because she's my wife. <laughs> and uh, the result was that this woman accepted Christ, right? She came to faith in Christ because of the, the sign and the testimony that was demonstrated before her and the power of God that was revealed there. So is there an appropriate use of the gift of tongues within the congregation? The answer is absolutely, but it needs to be done appropriately and in order as we will learn more about next week as we continue. Now, some of you are like, well, I don't know about all this. I mean, this sounds just really weird. I, I just don't know what to think about this. And I, I want to be very transparent with you and just say, I get it. I, I get where you're coming from. And if this makes you uncomfortable, I can understand why it would. It has been abused. It has been terribly abused in, in, in the church in many ways. Um, the gift of tongues seems to be a very flashy gift and the exercise of it in an irresponsible way can draw attention to the person who's received the gift rather than direct people to glorify God. And it has been used in some churches as a spiritual litmus test to determine whether or not you're saved or how spiritual you are or are not. And the reality is 
Tongues or any gift of the Spirit is not evidence of Christian maturity. Love, the fruit of the Spirit, is evidence of Christian maturity. Amen? The gifts are simply given for the edification, the exhortation, and the comfort of the body. Now, I have experienced personally, in a firsthand way, the abuse of this particular gift. And um, I've been meaning for some time to, to share a story with you, and I've been trying to just discern the, the best place to share it, and I suppose this is it. So this is less a Bible study than simply a testimony of my own experience as it relates to the gifts of the Spirit. And I want to share this uh, not to, to draw attention to myself, but perhaps to provide some perspective for any of you who may lack it or be somewhat confused about what we're talking about. Um, years ago, when I was just turned 19, fresh out of high school, uh, the year was 1988, and my girlfriend at the time had given me a pamphlet uh, called 88 Reasons the Rapture Will Be in 1988. Clearly, the person who wrote that pamphlet was wrong, completely and totally wrong. And at the time, I had enough sense to know that the scripture said that no man knows the day nor the hour, but only the Father. Not even the Son, only the Father. And yet, there was enough in that book that I was at least concerned about the state of my eternal soul, right? And I remember thinking, you know, if I step off of a curb and get hit by a bus tomorrow, it won't really matter when the rapture of the church is because effectively it'll be accomplishing the same purpose, right? I don't know when Jesus is returning for his church. He says that he comes quickly. Quickly doesn't necessarily mean soon. It means quickly, right? Uh, we expect him at any moment, and so did the disciples back in their day. But one thing I can promise you, and those of you who've been around a while, you know what I'm about to say. I can guarantee you that one of two things is going to happen in your lifetime. Either Jesus Christ will return for the church and the rapture will occur, in which case you will find yourself standing before Jesus, or you will die, in which case you will find yourself standing before Jesus. Do you see my point? Whether it's the rapture of the church, which you have no idea when that's going to happen, or it's the day of your death, which you also have no idea when that's going to happen, at some point in your existence, you will stand before God to give an account for yourself. Amen? And what you did with Jesus. And so I came to that realization, and I found myself at a church that Sunday morning. And it, it happens to be a church that I now know was doctrinally way off base. They believed in a variety of problematic things. First of all, they believed in modalism, which means they believed only in Jesus, right? And you say, well, what about the Father? Oh, that's Jesus. What about the Holy Spirit? Oh, that's Jesus. It's all Jesus. And unless you were baptized in the name of Jesus, then it didn't count, right? Never mind the fact that Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And they look at that and they'll say, oh, no, 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 no. But every time we see it happening in scripture, we always see them baptizing people in Jesus' name. Well, that means they're baptizing them in the authority that Jesus gave them. That's what that means. You say, well, how do you baptize people, Pastor Ken? I baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And then everybody's happy, right? <laughs> and so they believe only in Jesus, right? That's their belief. They also believed that if you were not water baptized, you were not saved. Baptismal regeneration. So they believed in modalism. They believed in baptismal regeneration. They also believed that if you did not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit as evidenced by speaking in tongues, you were not saved. These were things that they believed. Well, on that morning, I didn't know any of that, and I didn't care about any of that. All I knew was that I needed Jesus. And I went to the service, and I heard the sermon, and after the sermon, someone in the pew next to me saw that I was weeping, just bawling my eyes out, and they said, do you want to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior? And I said, yes, of course, absolutely. And so they led me in a prayer, and I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior that day. Praise the Lord. And then they said to me, well, would you like to be baptized? 
at that moment, they could have asked me if I'd have liked a lifetime subscription to, you know, Tupperware magazine. I'd have, I'd have, yes. I was ready to, to receive whatever it was that God had for me at that moment. And so I'm like, yes, I, I'd love to be baptized. And so they, they took me in the back, gave me a robe. This is one of those places where the baptismal waters are always on tap. I mean, it's full all the time after every service. And so if you get saved, you're going to get baptized right then and there. And so I went up there and I went into the, the pool and the pastor was getting ready to baptize me. And he said, listen, he says, when you come up out of the water, I want you to just praise God, just worship the Lord and praise God. And there's, you, you may start speaking in tongues. Don't be surprised if that happens. This is what he told me. And so I'm like, okay, absolutely, let's do it. And so he takes me below the water, brings me up out of the water, and I begin to praise the Lord. And every word that came out of my mouth was English, completely, totally English, no question about it. And that was fine until the pastor said these words, pray faster. And at that moment, everything spiritual, except perhaps discernment, stopped dead in its tracks in my heart and mind. You see, his goal was for me to pray faster and to trip over my words so that it would somehow spontaneously result in my speaking in tongues or at least perhaps seem as though I were and I got out of the water and got out of there as quickly as I could and never went back because that, my friends, was the flesh and I wanted nothing to do with it. Now, fortunately, the Lord took my commitment seriously and he accepted me and I was born again that day, praise the Lord for it. And, and there was a change in my life. I ended up joining the army and I went away to basic training. And if you know me, you know I'm an avid reader. I love to read. And um, in basic training, you don't, you don't get to, to carry around your favorite book with you. You can have access to two books and two books only. One of them is your smart manual, right? Your training manual. And the other one is your Bible because they are legally prohibited from taking that from you. And so I had one of those little Gideon Bibles, those green ones, you know, and I carried that thing in my cargo pocket everywhere I went. And if you know anything about the military, you know and understand the phrase, hurry up and wait. How many of y'all know the phrase, hurry up and wait? Yeah, hurry up and wait. And so there was a lot of hurry up and waiting in basic training, especially considering the fact that I was at, uh, at, uh, <laughs> I was at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, affectionately referred to as Fort Lost in the Woods, um, in the middle of January. So it was freezing. It was cold. And so we were always waiting for something because any truck that was coming to move us from one spot to it, it was always a delay, right? And so I would take that time to read this little New Testament. And I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, first and second. I read the whole thing in the space of that, uh, of that couple of months in basic training. And after that, I was stationed at my next duty station, which was a training base, uh, the, the Presidio of Monterey, the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California. Um, and I got busy flunking out of Korean as quickly as humanly possible. <laughs> Um, but while I was there for that very brief time, I encountered a fella uh, who was my squad leader and we were playing pool one day and I'm probably going into way more detail than you need in this story, but hey, here it is. So uh, we were playing pool one day while we were waiting for our class to get started and, and I had recently learned that the word amen meant or could be used to mean either I really agree with that or let it be so, right? And so... We're playing pool and he said something, don't remember what it was, but I really agreed with it. And I'm like, yeah, man, amen, that's awesome, amen. And so it's like he got this little look on his face, you know, the Christian radar went up. He's like, ooh, you might be a believer. And a few days pass by and he comes to me and he says, listen, man, um, are you a Christian? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. I was a new Christian, I was a young Christian, but I understood and I knew I was a Christian. And he said, well, I go to this Bible study on Friday nights uh, downtown at the Carpenters Union Hall. It's one of those little churches where they set up the chairs on Friday, have their Bible study, and then Sunday morning they have their church service, and then they take all the chairs down again. He says, do, do you want to go with me? I'm like, sure, yeah, I'll go with you. So we went. And while we were there on that Friday night after we had set up all the chairs, there was a testimony that was being shared by a lady in the church 
whom God had used to establish uh, a series of home Bible studies. And she had an amazing testimony. It was awesome. I mean, the Lord actually taught this woman how to read by reading her Bible. It's like, she's like, you want me to start home Bible studies, Lord? I can barely read. He's like, I'll teach you to read, right? So that happened in her life. And one of the things that she shared was at these Bible studies, one thing that she had not anticipated was that people were being baptized in the Holy Spirit and that many of them were speaking in tongues. It was this, this whole thing. Well, after her testimony and the service was over, so, so it's important for me to note, church was over at this point. We were just all hanging around talking. I went up to her and I said, listen, I said, I just wanted to let you know I really appreciated everything you had to say. That was a great testimony, except for that speaking in tongue stuff. I don't know about that, but everything else was awesome. Now, I'm thinking at that moment, I've gone up to her and I've said, hey, great job. I can go now because I've done what I needed to do. But she stops me and she says, well, wait a second. You said you don't understand it. Would you like to understand it? And I said, well, well, yeah, I guess I'd like to understand it. And I was not, I was not all in at this point because I remembered the abuses that I had experienced before at my baptism and the way that that pastor had tried to manipulate the situation to make it sound like something was happening that wasn't happening. And so I was very hesitant, but I said, I do want to understand it. So we sat down on a couple of folding chairs over to one side of the sanctuary, and there were a couple others standing around, and she opens up her Bible, and this was the first time I had really seen a Bible that had been well used, right? And I'm sure I had seen one before. My aunt was a believer, and my mom and my grandma, but I'd never seen a Bible where they had just like marked up every page with all kinds of notes everywhere. It was clear that this lady was a student of the scriptures. And she began to walk me through a number of passages which she showed to me, among them 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14, and also the section in Luke where Jesus says, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit when you ask for it? And I had read all of these scriptures very recently as I went through basic training, but I was looking at them now within context of one another. And I was seeing how they correlated together and how together they created this framework that helped me to understand that as believers, we all have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. And that if we ask God for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives, he will give that to us. And that it's nothing that we need to be afraid of and that there's no performance involved in it. It is simply asking the Father who loves to give us gifts for the gifts that he wants to give us. That's it. That's all there was to it. And so I had the light bulb just poop, pop right on. And I understood for the first time. I understood. And so she asked me, she says, do you understand? I said, I get it. Yeah, I understand. Thank you so much for explaining that to me. And I'm starting to stand up because I've acknowledged her point. I had a question, she answered that question, she proved her point from the scriptures, I was satisfied. Great, thank you very much, time for me to go now, right? Oh no. She says then, would you like to experience this? And I thought, this is where it gets weird, isn't it? That's what I thought. <laughs> but at the same time, I also had this thought in the back of my head that was, Lord, if this is not of you, I don't want anything to do with it, right? But if this is of you, then I want it because, Lord, I want everything that you have for me. So, Lord, if this is of you, please, yeah, I do want this. And so I said to her, yes, I, I, I would like to experience that. And so she very calmly, very clearly said, okay, I'm just going to lay hands on you and pray for you that you would receive the Holy Spirit. And I just want you to ask God for the Holy Spirit. Just ask him and then just, just praise him, just worship him. That's all you have to do. Not any kind of, don't pray fast or pray like this or pray, just, just worship the Lord. And so we did that and she, she, she put her hand upon my head and she just prayed a very simple prayer that I would receive the Holy Spirit, that God would bless me with the gift of his Holy Spirit. And I prayed and I asked him for the Holy Spirit and I began to worship and I began to praise God. And friends, I have to be honest with you, every word that came out of my mouth, not one of them was English. 
I don't know what language they were, but they were not English. And there was a physical manifestation that I felt and that I can feel traces of even at this moment as I'm standing here before you, of just the anointing of God falling upon my head and running down my shoulders and down my arms. And it was electric and it was powerful. And I remember thinking, Lord, I need to know that this is you and that I'm not just doing this myself. And so I tried very hard to say just a single sentence in English and I wasn't able to do it. And I was overcome with an overwhelming sense of God's presence and joy beyond anything that I had ever experienced at that point in my life. And I knew that the Holy Spirit was present with me and that I was receiving the gifts of the Spirit in that moment. Now, I'm going to tell you something else. That was the one and only time I have ever spoken in tongues. I can't say as Paul did, I speak in tongues more than all of you. I don't speak in tongues. I don't believe that the gift of tongues is one of the spiritual gifts that God has given me. Do I have spiritual gifts? I believe that I do, and I believe I can recognize what some of them are. I believe that God has blessed me with the gift of teaching. I believe that he has gifted me at times with the gift of prophecy in regards to edification and exhortation and comfort. I believe that I can look at specific instances in my life where I know that God has given me a word of wisdom. I believe that there are some people that I've prayed for who've actually gotten better. And I'm not saying that I had the gift of healing, but there was a gift of healing in operation at that time. And I just happened to be the one that was there praying. Does that make any sense? But do I today currently operate in the gift of tongues? The answer is no, I don't. I would love to, but God didn't need my help making it happen the first time and he doesn't need my help making it happen again. So why then did I experience it at that moment? I believe there's a very specific reason that I experienced it at that moment. I believe I experienced it at that moment for you. And why do I say that? Because if I had not experienced it at that moment, then I would have forever believed that it was false. I would have believed that it was fake and that people who did that or tried to have others do that were just scamming them, just like that pastor that I had encountered about a year earlier, right? Because I had that negative experience, I was predisposed to believe that the gifts were a fraud. But God allowed me to experience them I believe, so that I would know that they are real and that they are true and that they are for today. Amen? Amen. And if you've received the gift of tongues, praise the Lord. Exercise it in a responsible way and be edified in your prayer time as you exercise that gift. And should the Lord bless us with someone who can interpret that gift, then praise the Lord. We'll see that experienced in our congregation and in our body. And if it happens, great. But you know what? I would rather, as Paul said, have five words spoken in a, in a known language that can edify the body than 10,000 in an unknown tongue that only edifies the individual who presents it. Why? Because we are to be motivated by love in our exercise of the gifts. And we should desire those gifts that build up, edify, exhort, and encourage, and bring comfort to the body, because that's what the gifts were given to accomplish. They were given to each one for the good of all. Amen? So let's desire those greater gifts, but let's always pursue love. Let's pray.